everybody. I'm X-Ray. I'm your host for today. And we're welcome to DEF CON 30 Alt Space VR Virtual Reality Theater, where we're having DEF CON presentations. Uh, you're probably sick of hearing me hearing this, but or hearing this from me, but new people are popping in and out all the time. Our next speaker is Guile. Guile has been uh, volunteering with different online communities for the past two years by mentoring moderating Discord servers and presenting in different community-based InfoSec conferences. She's been in the tech industry since the early part of this century. Gail has a graduate certificate in response from the Sands Institute and a master's in cybersecurity and digital forensics from the NSW Canberra. Her day job includes doing proactive and reactive work as an incident responder. And her talk is how my high school creative writing class helped me to become a better incident responder. So, Gal, please take it away. Thank you. And let me just go there. Oh, wait a minute. Got to make sure you have access to the stage. Okay. That might help. <laughs> okay. Let's see if I could get there. There you go. You have access okay. now. There we go. Okay, so okay, there we go. So I do. Do I have megaphone access now? Can everybody hear me properly? Great, sounds good. Okay, thank you. So good morning, everyone. Uh, I want to say good morning. It's uh, four a.m. here. Um. Uh, Two minutes after 4 a.m. So I am um, calling, uh, I'm dialing into this uh, virtual reality space from NARM or Melbourne, Australia. So uh, first off, I'd like to start by doing an acknowledgement of country. I'm presenting from the lands of the Bunurong people and I wish to acknowledge them as traditional owners. I would also like to pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and Aboriginal elders of other communities who may be here today. Thank you. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide. Yes. Okay. So I've been introduced. Thank you very much for that. So I just wanted to add that uh, I'm part of the first cohort of Project Friedman. So Project Friedman is an initiative here in Australia by the Women Speak Cyber and the AWSN Australian Women in Security Network to help make sure that we have diversity of thought and representation in our uh uh, security, our InfoSec community here in Australia. We, I got uh, training in terms of how to present in conferences. Okay. So uh, I do have a Twitter account. I have open DMs. So please feel free to, you know, uh, send me a DM if you have any questions afterwards uh, about my presentation. Next slide, please. Okay, so for this presentation, I'm going to be covering, you know, three uh, areas here. So first, first off, I'm going to talk about, you know, uh, what's that creative nerd there. And then after that, I'm going to talk about the uh, incident response. And then I'm going to be, you know, uh, giving some parting words. Okay, so uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this is a photo, an old photo of mine, and this dates back from my high school uh, time. And uh, I was just this particular day, I remember this vividly because uh, I was just, you know, I brought uh, the family camera, and this was before the time of like, you know, digital cameras and all those things where you had to make sure you have a negative, you know, and then we have to take, take it to a store to have it processed. So I was like, you know, being all silly and just being goofy. And I borrowed one of my classmates, you know, Beret, and I'm just like pretending I'm, you know, the artsy fartsy person. And just for context, I, I actually went to a public school that is known for its strong science and math. 
uh, yeah, curriculum. It was called um, a science high school. So the concept uh, was that uh, there be uh, high schools that are really focused on the STEM or to make sure that uh, the students have this good background in science, technology, and mathematics in the hopes that we will go to the university and major in the STEM areas. So uh, if, if, you, if you cannot tell from my accent, I'm originally from the Philippines and I migrated to Australia. Okay, so, um, so I was really lucky to get into that school because the uh, entrance exam was really very competitive and we were like ranked and then we had to make sure that we also passed the interviews. But the great thing about being in that science high school was that there was also uh, what we call like electives. So we can take uh, non-science and technology classes. And one of the first things that I signed up for was the creative writing class. And honestly, I was like really glad that uh, this was before social media. So anything that I you know, uh, had in terms of photos and all those things were safe until my dad discovered Facebook and started scanning all my high school photos and started sharing it to everyone. So this particular, well, in a way, uh, that was great because I asked him earlier this week, hey, dad, do you remember, do you have one of my photos from my school? Ah, sure, sure, which one? And then just sent me this one. So that's the background. That's the context of why I, you know, called myself the creative nerd because I was a nerd first before I became a geekette. Okay, and so um, uh, next slide. So next slide, please. So one of the first things that I learned from my high school creative uh, writing class was to really do research and, you know, document whatever that I've come up with. And at the time, I like to interviews, you know, contact people and interview them uh, for your story or you read up like a physical. Or um, we had internet back then. And the way to do research is actually go to a physical library, talk to a librarian, and then, you know, uh, if you need like a book or something, there was the card catalog. Quick show of hands here or like, um, um, uh, like show me your emojis. Anybody here has seen and used a card catalog in the library? Okay, any emojis? Okay. <laughs> okay, just a few. Uh, okay, great. Okay, that's good. So for those who haven't used a card catalog, so think of it like before we had the search engines like, you know, uh, Google. Before Google, there was like Yahoo. You know, that was the uh, way how we did like research in the library. There's a series of like cards and then they're, uh, they're alphabetically arranged. It's, you know, you have topics, then you have like titles, and then it could be arranged by, you know authors okay so that's how we did uh the research okay so the first thing the most important thing before you start you know like writing anything you have to think of an idea like what do you want to you know uh Tell. what's the story that you you want to tell you have to start with an idea but the challenge is that sometimes if you're just like you know stuck in a rut you know you can't really think of a uh, of an, uh, an idea. That's why there are things like story prompts. So I remember uh, like uh, a week after like the first class uh, and we were told, uh, come up with an idea. So uh, the teacher, you know, said like, okay, so what are your story ideas? And a lot of us were stumped and that's why she introduced like story uh, prompts. So what are story prompts? It's sort of like just a sentence, you know, like about something and then you start, you know, building up, you know, uh, from that particular story. So you start with the idea. Then after that, you know, you think of a setting. So you have to make sure that you do your research in terms of your setting. Uh, where it's going to be? Is it going to be like local to our area or is it in another city, another, you know, uh, location? Or if, if you're thinking of something like writing, like science fiction, is it set in this planet or another planet, another galaxy? And then think of the period. When we say period, we're talking about the time okay is it like is it your story set in the present or is it in the future or are you talking about or are you thinking about uh having it having a historical you know context so you gotta like do your research regarding that particular period 
And then, of course, there's character building. So for those of you who are, you know, into games or let's just say uh, uh, Dungeons and Dragons, so you're probably familiar with, you know, uh, that particular, you know, you have the, or the uh, think of it as like what's going to be, you know, the moral code of your, you know, character. Uh, you're going to be thinking about, okay, are they, you know, uh, more on the good side, you know, like evil side or you're neutral. But mostly when we start writing, we think of your hero, your protagonist, okay? So, and then you have to start thinking about their, you know, inner world, about their origin story, where did they come from? So you have to start thinking about that. Okay, and then lastly, of course, depending on the setting, you know, it's going to be about the uh, genre. So if you're Thinking about like something in the future set in the plan, uh, other planets or other galaxies or something. So that could be science fiction. But within science fiction, there's a lot of things that you can explore there. So all in all, all these things that you've thought about, you need to make sure that you've done your uh, research and you've documented everything. You need to make sure that you, you know, write notes. And at that time... I just want to uh, show, uh, like, share this. My first attempt uh, in using a computer. At that time, okay, there was a lot of. It was summer, and uh, there were a lot of uh, power outages. And I went to an uh, to my mom's friend's house who had a computer. And at that time. I really didn't know how to use a computer and I just wanted to make sure that I'm able to type my story and I was told okay this is how you do that okay so that's your screen black screen you know that was word perfect and I um, have all these handwritten notes and I have this story that I've written on paper but as I was typing I you know there are like other ideas that came in and I just kept like uh, you know, uh, typing everything. And then suddenly there was power outage. And then after like about 15 minutes, the power came back. And then I asked my, uh, I call him uncle. Okay, although I'm not, you know, uh, biologically related to him. Uh, I asked my uncle's kid, okay, so, okay, where's my work? I was like just typing and then suddenly the lights went out and after that it came back on and I don't see my words there. And then he looked at me and asked like, did you remember to save it? Like, uh, what do you mean by saving? <laughs> uh, okay, there was no way for me to recover you know, those, like, I think I spent about three hours typing up my story and then like, okay. And that was my first experience in making sure that I always have, you know, redundancy. I have like backups and all those, you know, things. So things that I learned from my creative writing class has really helped me when I shifted careers, like, you know, move into tech. Okay. Now, um, uh, next slide, please. Okay. Now, so another important thing that I learned from my uh, creative writing class was about the plot structure. Think of a plot structure, if you're a visual person, think of it like a mountain. So sometimes it's called a story mountain, and sometimes you just uh, see some examples like a plot diagram. So you can see towards um, the left, you have their left side of the mountain there, you have the exposition. So think of it as the part of the plot when you start introducing your protagonist, okay? And you also set the setting and the location there. And then uh, afterwards, you have what is called the pacing action. This is the part of the story that, uh, this is basically after you've set your tone okay and you've written something about your readers i'm sorry you've written something about your protagonist and your readers are now invested in your protagonist and think of the rising action as an event that interrupts this pattern and this basically begins the story arc uh, think of it as also uh, it could be like there's a first conflict you know, the, in your story, and then it ends with an event that changes everything for your protagonist. 
Okay, then towards the uh, top of the story mountain, okay, you have your climax. This follows the rising action. This is when everything comes together to create that single dramatic moment. So that is the climax of the story. Okay, and then after the climax of the story, you have to have the falling action. Sometimes some writers immediately move from climax to the resolution. But it is better to have a falling action because you have to make sure that the tension and the conflict has started to resolve and then your story starts winding down towards the resolution. And when we talk about the resolution, that is basically the conclusion of your story's plot. It could be just one scene or, or it could be a series of scenes okay, that will tie down your narrative arc to make sure that uh, you show that something happened to the protagonist and then what happened to that protagonist and what changed in that protagonist's you know, life. Okay, so that is the resolution. So this is basically your plot structure. Okay, and all, you know, stories you have this plot structure. Okay, now, uh, next slide, please. Okay, now, sorry, I just have to uh, have a sip of water here. So in terms of um, the other th uh, important thing that I learned in my creative writing class is about knowing uh, my reader, okay, and knowing myself, okay. So first of all, I I have to make sure that I understand who's my target audience. I need to know, okay, am I writing uh, for, let's just say, my friends, family members, or am I writing for my classmates, or am I writing for the community? Okay, and because de depending on your target audience, you there is, um, think of it in terms of like the words that you use. So, of course, you um, in terms of community, like in the Philippines when I was growing up, it was quite conservative. And uh, the first story that I wrote was about a same-sex, uh, you know, relationship. And at that time, that was considered quite controversial. And I like, hey, you're too young to be writing about those stuff. And I was like, you know, talking about like it's about someone finding their identity and all those things yeah but i have to sort of like uh be very careful about the terminologies and all those things yeah so in a way i was self-censoring but you know in um years later i just realized that nah i shouldn't like self-censor myself because i'm basically writing for myself so and then uh how will you tell your story so um you basic, uh, basically, there's the plot structure, you've done your research, and then how am I going to be telling my story? Okay, so these are like the important things that I've learned from my creative writing uh, class that I still remember like after like uh, so many decades later. So what happened to this uh, this creative nerd. So the creative nerd went to the university instead of majoring in science technology. I majored in psychology because I wanted to understand myself better. And at that time, it was you know difficult having like a career out of the university as you know a psychologist or as a psychology major. So my family wanted me to either go to med school or law school. And I initially thought I want to go to med school, but uh, I dropped. I, I thought like, nah, I don't want to do like you know all the dissection and all those things. And then I decided I'm just gonna go to law school. So I, after finishing my degree in psychology, I went to uh, law school. And when I was there, I realized that, hey, uh, I'm not like the very argumentative type because I'm turning into a very argumentative person. No matter what happens, uh, we were being trained to win every single, you know, little argument. And I thought like, that's not what I want to do. And so I got out of law school after uh, two years. So I joked that, hey, that, does that make me an outlaw? Because I dropped out. <laughs> anyway, then I got connected to the internet. 
And when I got connected to the internet, I realized, oh, there's a world out there and I want to be part of it. And that started my shift, career shift to um, uh, tech. So early part of this century, I moved into tech and I started my career doing networking stuff, Cisco stuff, and I love that. But I really wanted to focus on cybersecurity or at the time it was uh, network security. It's largely because when I got connected to the internet, I used IRC and I had an online stalker. So that's why I was like really concerned about security. So anyway, eventually, so from doing like networking, network security stuff, I moved into cybersecurity and I, I really wanted to do forensic stuff because I've been reading a uh, you know mystery uh, since I was a kid mystery novels all those things so now if I'm at this point in my life and my career we're in I'm doing something that I really love and it's uh, digital forensics and you know focusing on digital forensics and incident response so now uh, next slide please let's talk about incident response response okay now quick question for the uh, listeners what is the first thing that uh, um, you know goes into your mind when you are uh, when you think about the response okay. next slide please do you do you think of yourself like you know having like a similar you know expression to this person in this photo Okay. Yeah. So sometimes, okay, people like uh, oh, consider like incident response as one of the more stressful kind of work in the infosec area because basically you're being called upon to um, respond to a particular incident. Okay. So next slide, please. Okay. Now. Um, before I start talking about incident response, I just want to clarify uh, something about the terminology, okay? So um, when we talk about uh, incidents, we need to always clarify that when, it, uh, when we're talking about incidents, okay? So uh, first off, okay, uh, there's the word event. When we say event in the con context of incident re uh, response, an event is just basically something that is observable. Okay? An event is something that is observable. So it could be, you know, there was um, a user connected to a particular website, went to, visited a particular website, you know, uh, so that's an event. That is something that is observable. Now, when we talk about incident, incident basically means uh, there was an event, an observable uh, happening. Okay, how did you observe that? You have like logs, okay, you have some evidence there. And the event itself, okay, that observable um, is something that breaks, you know, the uh, security triad, the CIA either confidentiality, integrity, availability. So that becomes an incident. So basically an incident is an event that's observable, but it, you know, affects the CIA or it, uh, you know, breaks certain, you know, uh, security policies in your organization. So when we talk about incident response, uh, it is a process to help protect the organization and it has several stages. So what's the difference between digital forensics and incident response? So digital forensics by itself is both an art and a science in terms of uh, understanding what has happened within a system or in, inside, let's just say, an organization or within your you know, network infrastructure or your infrastructure. So there are different artifacts. When we say artifacts, these are like the evidence, sources of evidence. And then incident response uh, uses a lot of the techniques and knowledge from digital forensics in, in order to help protect your 
organization. So, incident response is, think of it like a practical organization, uh, sorry, incident response is the practical application of your digital forensics. So, the incident response is like you're responding to, to an incident right now, the, car, uh, the present moment. And then digital forensics, think of it, you're looking at what happened in the past. So, you're using your different tools and techniques to understand what happens. You're collecting all these artifacts, evidence, you're making sure that you preserve them just in case uh, you need to present this, you know, uh, case in court. Okay, so that's uh, the difference between digital forensics and incident response. Now, next slide, please. Okay, now when we talk about incident process, there are several frameworks that are available out there. So the first one is the NIST that's from the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And this is uh, this particular uh, incident response framework is actually in the special publication 800-61 revision 2 or 800-61 R2. So NIST is a government agency and uh, works on technology and their framework for incident response or they have sometimes like you can see it like incident handling. Uh, there are four steps. Now there is SANS, okay, so uh, SANS uh, is known for providing uh, security training and initially SANS uh, used to call itself a SIS admin audit network and security, so that's the meaning of SANS. Okay, and compared to the NIST, this is a private organization and they're very much focused on security. And for them, their uh, incident response framework has six steps. So think of them, you have the PSERL. This is the acronym for those steps for, their, for the SANS incident response framework. Now, uh, can you please go to the next slide, please? Okay, so for NIST, you have there the four steps in the incident response. So you have preparation, and then you have detection and analysis, and then after the detection and analysis, you have containment, eradication, and recovery, and then after that, you have the post-incident activity. Okay, now let's look at the next slide, please. Can you please go to the next slide? So for SANS, uh, compared to the NIST framework, SANS has six uh, steps. There are six uh, phases. So there's the preparation, identification, containment, eradication, recovery, and lessons learned. So next slide, please. Okay, so comparing this, you can see that both framework has the preparation phase, Okay, and then you have the identification phase as the second uh, phase, and then you have the containment eradication recovery, which are three separate phases from SANS, is actually the third phase under NIST, and then the lessons learned phase from SANS is uh, uh, called uh, the post-incident activity. Okay, so uh, at this point, I'm just going to go through the six steps of the science framework. So when we talk about the preparation phase, this is where you should be making sure that you have your documentation in place. There you, ideally, you have your um, security policies, okay? You do your reviews and you know, you make sure that the security policies are well known in the organization. This is the time we're in, you're also doing a, you know, risk assessment. You're basically making sure that you know all your assets when we talk about assets. So these are your uh, endpoints, uh, end when we say endpoints in the context of incident response, it's your laptops, desktops, okay? And then you also have to make sure that you identify uh, what are the sensitive assets, and then you also make sure that you define which are the critical security incidents that the team should focus on. Because you don't want to make, you know, you don't want to call like the incident responder when you're just dealing, let's just say, with, uh, ter with what turns out to be as you know like a desktop issue when it you know it could be like oh the printer didn't work or something so that's not uh it's 
security incident. Okay? You have to make sure that you have a definition of severity levels, priority. And during the preparation phase, okay, if your organization hasn't built like a CSERT, a computer security incident response team, this is the time that you should be doing that. Okay, during the preparation phase. And then you're also making sure that your team is prepared to respond to incidents at this point. Now, the second phase is called identification. So this is when you have uh, monitoring of your systems and then you have to know what is normal operation, what is normal for your organization. And this is the uh, the phase wherein you are detecting any de deviation from the normal operations. And you have to understand or like uh, check, make sure that these are uh, representing actual security in, uh, incidents. And during the identification phase, when you know an incident is discovered, you need to collect additional evidence, you need to establish the type, severity, and you need to document everything. Okay. And then from that second uh, phase, uh, you now go to the third, like, you know, the step. This is wherein you do the containment. You perform, you know, short-term containment. Like, for example, you may need to isolate certain part of your network or a network segment that is under attack. And then you move to uh, long-term containment wherein you, you may need to implement some temporary fixes to make sure that your systems uh, can still continue to be used in production while at the same time you are rebuilding the clean systems okay and then from the containment phase you move to the eradication phase this is where you if you are uh, affected by a malware you're removing malware from all your affected systems and this is when you're trying to understand the root cause of the attack and then you are making sure that you're trying to prevent similar attacks you know to happen in the future and of course, that goes hand in hand with recovery, wherein you will be bringing back your production systems online. You have to be careful before you bring back your production systems online. And typically for uh, a lot of the incident, uh, uh, incidents I've work, uh, worked in previously, there's always a check of the systems. Uh, like for example, if there was a ransomware attack, though before a system is fully back, fully put back to the production we have to make sure that we have swept the entire system are there any indicators of compromise there is this a clean system can we put it back uh, online or if it's like a backup make sure that the backup is clean okay and then part of the recovery uh phase is to test and verify you monitor all the affected systems to make sure that they're back to their normal activity to the you know like think of it like business as usual and then lastly you have the lessons learned uh, phase this is very important some organizations do, you know don't do this but it's very important that you know you have a time frame um it's best that you know, like two, three weeks, not let's just say six months or one year after the incident. It has to be as soon as possible. Okay. Maybe it's like two weeks. Okay. You need to uh, perform, let's just say like a review of the incident. You need to make sure that you have a complete, you know, documentation of the incident. And then if you need to further investigate the incident, and then you need to understand uh, what um, was done to contain that incident and then whether there's any improvement in the process you know if you have like issues in terms of processes you know technology or people this is the time we're in you're supposed to you know uh, learn from this particular you know incident but there should be no shaming no victim blaming and all those things okay so that's our, you know, our, um, you know, basis in the incident response. Okay. Now, in terms of the preparation uh, phase, okay, uh, you can see towards the right of this particular sl uh, slide, I have an arrow called proactive. So in incident uh, response, we have what we call like proactive and reactive side. So when we say proactive, this is the part we're in. We are doing 
uh, proactive projects or think of it like you know activities to help prepare us and then towards the uh, identification phase towards the uh, lessons learned these are part of the reactive we're in you're actually reacting to an ongoing incident in your organization so one of the activities that we do in terms of uh, the proactive side of incident response is doing a table tabletop exercise. Next slide, please. Okay. So who among you here has participated in a tabletop exercise? Somebody could like, you know, you know, react, call someone. Okay, the rest. Okay, cool. Now, for the others who haven't like participated in a tabletop exercise, I'm just going to be like explaining what is involved there. Sometimes it's called TTX for short, tabletop exercise. So think of a tabletop exercise as a mock incident. So it's not a functional exercise. When we say functional exercise, you, uh, you present, you know, the group, okay, with, uh, you know, alerts and they're supposed to be, you know, uh, trying to uh, simulate, you know, how you're supposed to be uh, responding, like, you're going to be checking the dashboards at a functional exercise. When we talk about uh, tabletop exercise, it's a mock incident, okay? There is a security incident, and you are just giving them scenarios. Think of it as just scenarios, and they're not going to be checking any dashboards. They're not going to be logging into, you know, the monitoring systems or the EDR, the endpoint detection response, you know, tools. They're not going to be looking at that. So this is purely... Sorry, excuse me. Okay, this is purely uh, a tabletop exercise. Uh, think of it, it's, you know, uh, purely, you know, scenario based. You are not responding to a real incident. Everybody's just, you know, uh, there, you know, sitting down and everybody's just discussions. Uh, I'm sorry. Everybody's just uh, doing some discussions. Okay. And um, the goal here, uh, okay, there will probably be several goals, but mostly is to test the IR plan and then test the readiness of the organization in terms of like, if something similar to this scenario happened to your organization, what are you supposed to do? Who's supposed to be doing this? Who's supposed to be, um, uh, who's supposed to be leading the incident? Who's supposed to be doing those other things that are in the IR plan? So before you actually have a tabletop exercise, make sure that you have at least even like a basic IR plan in place. And everybody who is involved in responding to the incident should be familiar with the IR plan. Okay, now, uh, in terms of making sure that the discussion moves along, Okay, you need to make sure that when you create tabletop exercises, you have injects. So injects are additional information that you provide to the participants in your tabletop exercise. Ideally, the audience or the people who are participating in the tabletop exercise is composed of people who will be part of the incident. Okay, so you'll have a mix of uh, technical people and then also the best a tabletop exercise will also have some people who are in the management area because you will need to make sure that you involve uh, certain, you know, managers or so they're aware of what's happening. And then sometimes if let's just say a particular incident would involve communicating with external agencies or external, you know, parties, you need to make sure that you have someone, let's just say, doing the comms. Uh, for this because uh, it could be let's just say the incident is like ransomware you're preparing for a potential ransomware attack you need to make sure that you have somebody who's in the legal team who may need to contact the insurance for your cybersecurity insurance and then the other could be that you need to have an external facing statement 
from the corporate communications, you know, providing, you know, a message out there that you're under, you have the situation under control and you're investigating it. So it would be good to have all these people who would potentially be involved in a major uh, security incident. Okay, make sure that you have them there. Okay, so uh, how are we, uh, or like in my case, um, when I started, you know, creating uh, scenarios for tabletop exercises for my previous clients, this is where uh, the creative nerd came out. So I was a nerd first before I became a geek. So the creative nerd in me started thinking about the things that I learned in my creative writing class. So next slide, please. Okay. So whenever I created scenarios, I made sure that I'm familiar with my clients incident response plans and the incident response plan uh, would actually have, you know, all these different IR bases, you know, identified there. So when I created, you know, um, scenario, every time I need to create our scenario, of course, I need to make sure that first, okay, I set the scene. So think of it, it's like uh, towards the left of that flat mountain. So I'm basically providing, uh, think of it, I'm basically providing the exposition. So usually I put something there like there's a day. Okay, let's just say it's uh, Wednesday morning. Okay, um, a user may, you know, a user uh, contacts the help desk saying that uh, they, they saw something unusual in their uh, screen. And there was a strange message there. So think of it as, you know, uh, preparing your, you know, scene there. So you're basically uh, doing your exposition. And then afterwards, uh, next inject, you know, um, for that tabletop exercise, other users started complaining that they can't do anything. So you're basically setting up the rising action. And then you start doing, if you're the incident responder, you start identifying who are the affected people. And then you ask them for, let's just say, any screenshots or read out, like if there's like any message that they see there. And then you have towards the top, the climax, so wherein you're doing the containment eradication, maybe because you know there's like another inject you started like you know you saw the message and then you did some research turns out it's a ransom note and it's with a particular let's just say threat actor or a particular group apt groups that's like using this kind of let's just say malware and then you start doing your uh, containment eradication and then you have your Falling action or in your started doing your recovery as part of your incident response. What are you supposed to do? So it could be that you have other systems that were affected and you started like um, using, you know, your clean backups, putting them back there. And then you have the resolution. Think of it. It's your lessons learned towards the end of that particular scenario in your tabletop exercise. So uh, for those who may be tasked to do uh, tabletop exercises, remember this plot structure and then think of it, it's sort of like kind of map to the different faces there and you can write appropriate injects for your particular scenario, okay? Now, uh, next slide, please. Okay. Now, after your tabletop exercise has been, you know, conducted, make sure that you have an after action report. Okay, this is important. This is basically documenting what was, um, you know, the uh, what happened during the tabletop exercise, like for particular, you know, parts of these scenario that uh, based on the injects. What uh, what was this decision? What did people you know decide? What did they do? Uh, if let's just say your goal was to improve the IR plan or the IR process, you have to um, 
make sure that you someone during the tabletop exercise someone was like taking down notes uh, and then these notes will form the basis of your after action report you need to identify let's just say according to the incident response plan uh, whenever uh, let's just say uh, major severity uh, or you know let's just say major you know uh, cybersecurity incident uh, happens uh, there should be a message that goes out to the group chat over let's just say uh, slack okay so if you're using slack so according to your um, ir plan you're supposed to be using slack and then during the tabletop exercise people started you know saying that oh we're just going to start sending messages via whatsapp so there's a deviation between uh, the practice, actual practice, and the plan. So you'll have to like decide as an organization, like, are we going to change our incident response plan to indicate that whenever there's an incident, we're supposed to be using WhatsApp. So the question is, is WhatsApp one of your approved, you know, application when in fact you have Slack? So these uh, things that you've learned during the tabletop exercise, you put it in the after action report so that it will drive changes. Sometimes the uh, incident response plan has, uh, like, firstly, you were using, let's just say, an old you know, uh, ticketing system and then you move to a new ticketing system. And by the time that you did this tabletop exercise, everybody kept referring to the new ticketing system so you need to you know update your IR plan okay now uh, next slide please another application of the creative writing um, class you know uh, learnings I had was whenever I actually um, uh, sit down and then I need to write a lessons learned report. So this is towards the reactive part of our IR process. So uh, I make sure that I, I have doc documented what I've done. So this is like uh, the how. And then sometimes there's the question like why? Why was this particular, you know, um, let's just say finding important. Why is it important? Okay, and then um, then I have to make sure that I actually put there some recommendations so that, you know, in the future, what can we do in order to reduce the risk of this uh, similar incidents? And then um, sometimes when I write lessons learned report, it could be quite, you know, depressing okay, because of what happened. And uh, just, you know, between us in this particular uh, uh, space, okay, there were times where in, um, there were parts there that I knew with our team has already um, provided in a previous incident, but this particular client didn't learn from it. <laughs> you know, they didn't like, you know, they didn't uh, implement those changes. And then, you know, about a year or 18 months later, the same thing happened again. Okay, so sometimes it could be quite, you know, uh, demoralizing. But I always try to, you know, remember, you know, uh, like recognizing the positive. Okay, so I at least put, uh, put something there. What was positive? Okay, I put something there. So it's not, you know, uh, depressing. <laughs> okay, and then next slide, please. So when I write the lessons learned report, I also have to uh, remember what are my reader's goals, okay? So who's my audience? So the report that I'm writing is something that's, go, uh, that's hopefully is going to be used as a guide by my clients. And then uh, one of the things that I always make sure is that I write a good executive report because depending on who your reader is, okay, there are some where in they don't uh, dwell into the technical aspect like the indicators of compromise. They just want to know what happened, and the executive, you know, summary must have those. You know, think of it 
the highlights, the important things. And especially for those higher ups, like executive level or something, they don't have time to dwell into the nitty gritty details and they just want, you know, the executive summary. But I also make sure that the technical aspects is also documented. It's put in the lessons learned uh, report so that for the other teams that exist, it could be like engineering, it could be like, uh, let's just say if the network was, you know, uh, part, if there's like something like network related in the particular uh, incident. So people in the network engineering, they, they look at it, they understand something there. So it's very important to make sure that I have the reader's goals in mind when I'm writing, okay? And then next slide, please. Okay, so in conclusion, okay, uh, I want everyone to remember the mounting. <laughs> so every time you look at the mounting, so I hope you remember the plot structure because the plot structure will help you in terms of uh, framing the narrative when you're uh, creating any tabletop exercise for any simulations, or if you are trying to write your uh, lessons learned report, like how did the event unfold? Okay, remember the mounting. And then second point, think of your reader, okay? Uh, who's your audience, okay? What are their goals? What do they want out of your, let's just say, your lessons learned report and make sure that you present it in an orderly manner. And then this one is uh, the call, my call to action to everyone. So everybody's saying like, oh, we have to be, you know, make sure that we have like uh, enough people going into STEM. Okay, please also support the arts and creative industries because all the things that um, that I'm doing in terms of the technical aspect, um, the background that I've had in high school in terms of creative writing and other artistic classes that I took as elective has helped me uh, in terms of communicating in uh, to the stakeholders, to management about, you know, issues or about incidents. So please let's uh, make sure that we support the arts and creative industries. Okay, then next slide, please. So if you have any questions, okay, don't know whether uh, we have that option here in this space or I am in uh, the Discord, okay, uh, you could ask me questions there or you can like send me a message or like send me a DM in Twitter, okay. Or it could be not even related to this, it could even be like questions about uh, where's the best coffee in Australia? Well, no secret about it, it's in Melbourne. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for your time, for having me here. And please take care, everyone. Okay? So, let me just... Okay. Go ahead and speak up. Dal should be able to hear what you're saying and respond. Okay. Is there a question? I think if there's a raise hand icon there. I did have a question. Um, so this is related to, but not exactly um, on your topic. Mm -hmm. So how often would you um, suggest that a company does tabletop exercises? Your audience, right I, now, we didn't hear that. Uh, uh, let me just repeat his question. Ideally, how often should a company uh, do a tabletop exercise? Did I get it correctly? Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. So ideally, it should be on an annual basis. Yes. So, and then why do I say on an annual basis? Because ideally, your IR plan should be reviewed on an annual basis. Okay. So the ideal scenario is that, or situation is that, um, you make sure that everyone's familiar with their incident response plan. So those who are involved in doing incident response should uh, have, you know, a chance to go through it, to read through it, and then uh, make sure that they're familiar with that. And then you can you make sure that you announce that you're gonna have a tabletop exercise. Make sure that everybody set aside time for that. It doesn't have to be long. It could just be three hours, okay, or four hours, depending on how long the scenario is. So you can block 
you know, like half day. And then you make sure that there is someone there who's taking down notes because that's needed for the after action report. Okay, and then you run your scenario and then based out of that, you know, scenario, then, you know, you go back if you need to, you know, uh, review, change your IR plan or if there are certain, you know, policies, you know, or processes or procedures that need to be updated. So ideally on an annual basis. And then uh, you make sure that once you've uh, updated your IR plan, you put there the date wherein you conducted your uh, table tabletop exercise okay so think of it as uh, you tested your IR plan with that tabletop exercise okay so does that answer your question yes thank you okay no worries okay anybody else okay no questions so once again thank you very much okay how do I drop the mic <laughs> uh, press the letter R on your keyboard Sorry, the letter what? Romeo R. Ah, Romeo. Okay, thank you. Okay, and let me thank you very much. Well, thank you, Gal, for an excellent presentation. Um, thank you. We have about six minutes till the next speaker, so hang around, take a bio break, yes. and we'll be right back. Okay.